darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Once a long time ago, people liked the world so much that they decided to write a story about it. So what they did, they wrote it in the Bible. They thought God made the world. They said first God made the sea. Then he made the birds. I am delighted that butterflies were made because I like to watch them flutter about. Adam and Eve, Eve lived in the Garden of Eden. The garden was beautiful. Through the biblical stories of the creation and Adam and Eve, we pass on to our children our moral and religious values. But today they're also learning another account of how all things began, that told by modern science. It has the evidence on its side, and it makes Adam and Eve seem like a just-so story. How's this come about? How can we tell them both that they're children of God and that they're children of the evolutionary process? This rather improbable spot is one of the unrecognized and forgotten birthplaces of the modern world. In 1793, a young man named William Smith came here to supervise the building of the canal to serve the North Somerset coal fields. Well, 200 years on, the canal has all but vanished. You can just make out the course of it sweeping round the bend. But William Smith's discovery survives because it was here that the natural world began to have a readable history. Though without formal education, he was the son of a village blacksmith in Oxfordshire. Smith became a canal builder, drainage engineer and mineral surveyor. He didn't see himself as a scientist, but simply as a businessman who needed to know where the different minerals could be found and why. A mine shaft gave him a deep vertical cut into the earth and a canal gave him a long cut. Putting the two together, he could build up a picture of the underlying structure of the whole landscape. Smith noted down the sequence of rock strata wherever he went and he did something else too. Smith collected fossils on a large scale. Here in this spot, in the upper inferior oolite, he collected trigonias, a bivalve. Further down, in the upper lias, he found these belemnites, rolled belemnites. And the fossils were never out of sequence. Smith brought his specimens and notes back to his lodgings in Rugbourne Farm, which he later called the birthplace of geology. By 1796, when he was still only 27 years old, Smith had shown that the succession of rocks and fossils was the same all over England and Wales. Now, others before him had had an inkling of the succession of strata, but nobody had managed to define it. The surface of the earth is like a layer cake that's been buckled and worn down. Rocks are being built up in one place, eroded away in another. The succession is hard to read. So why did Smith succeed? He succeeded because he made very large-scale observations. He could produce, for example, a section of the landscape, like this one, which rises through 20 strata, all the way from Bath to Salisbury and then on to Southampton. From the red marl and sandstone, through the limestones, to the chalk and the clay. But still more important, Smith saw the significance of the fossils. After all, a living organism is not going to occur outside the period of its existence on Earth. 
the fossil sequence provides a chronology, a fixed yardstick. With that yardstick, Smith was able to define the true succession of the rocks. And the prospect opened before him of a history of the Earth. The Earth is formed, as well as governed, like the other works of its great creator, according to regular and immutable laws, which are discoverable by human industry and observation. Large portions of the Earth once teemed with animation, and the animals and plants thus finely preserved in the solid parts of the Earth's interior are so materially different from those now in existence that they may be considered a new creation. Each layer of the rocks must be considered as a separate creation. Or how could the earth be formed, stratum on stratum, and each abundantly stored with a different race of animals and plants? We know from his library that Smith was a sincerely religious man and in those days people were inclined to take a pretty literal view of the creation story in Genesis. But it was clear to Smith that he could no longer think of the earth as having been made all at once, finished, complete. On the contrary, it's been built up layer by layer, often after violent upheavals. So Smith postulates a series of distinct creative acts of God, each superimposed upon the one before rather as we might rebuild a city on its old foundations. Each of the six biblical days of creation thus came to be interpreted as a whole geological epoch, a long period of change and upheaval. By allegorizing Genesis in this way, it was possible to work towards a fully historical science of geology. This was finally achieved by Charles Lyell in 1830. Men like Lyell believed in God and in divine interventions in the living world. But special interventions of God were no longer needed in geology. Lyell argued that there, natural causes were sufficient. During the 19th century, the public proved willing to accept the shift from a biblical seven-day creation to a separate creation for each geological epoch, and then finally, a continuous natural geological story. But could life be given the same treatment? That's more difficult, because for many people, life was essentially supernatural. It could only be brought into being by the breath of the divine spirit. So the controversies over Genesis and geology were as nothing to the storm that blew up when science began to encroach on the origin and development of life. And inevitably, the fossil record was at the centre of the argument. Here in the Sedgwick Museum at Cambridge, it's still laid out in sequence, much as it was available to Victorian science. In the ancient Cambrian rock, primitive sea creatures. And then, as we track through time, we come successively to the first mollusks, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. The Victorians didn't have our methods of dating, but it was evident that there must have been succession and indeed progression of living things on the earth over an immense period the traditional ladder of nature that rises step by step from the lowliest beings up to man has fallen forward horizontally and become a long series extended through time. Evidently, creation was never finished and perfect all at once. On the contrary, it is still in process. And only in the most recent deposits do we find traces of man. But does all this prove evolution? In the 1830s, Charles Lyell himself thought not. After all, large-scale geological change can be seen going on today. Biological change is not so obvious. Our everyday experience rather suggests that species are fixed. 
So Lyle continued to think, for the present, that God had specially created each species when its time came and then popped it into its proper habitat. And all his life, he remained emphatic that human, moral, and spiritual capacities could only be explained by special creation by God. The whole of nature had looked to people in the 18th century as though it had been designed by someone, like the great landscape gardens then so much in vogue. In the way each creature was perfectly adapted to its place in the whole stable, harmonious scheme of things, they saw evidence of the power and wisdom of God. This was the argument from design. When scientists began to look at nature historically, the challenge was to produce a better explanation of how living things have come to be so perfectly adapted to their ways of life and to each other. It was, of course, Charles Darwin, who found the new explanation. By the time he returned from the Beagle voyage in 1836, the new understanding of adaptation was already taking shape in his mind. Darwin settled in London for a few years, writing, making notes, walking in places like the newly opened London Zoo. In July, opened my first notebook on the transmutation of species had been greatly struck from about March by character of species of Galapagos archipelago. If we choose to let conjecture run wild, then animals may partake from our origin. In one common ancestor, we may all be knitted together. An extraordinary thought, but it went right against the standard idea of the fixity of species. Was there any evidence that species could change? Well, there was one, right under people's noses. All our domestic dogs have one common ancestor, apparently the wolf. Merely by selecting from the variety to be found in litters of pups, human breeders, in only a few thousand years, have created all the bizarre variety of our modern breeds of dog. Opponents will say, show me the intermediate forms. I will answer yes, if you will show me every step between bulldog and greyhound. But how could selection occur in nature? In October 1838, I happened to read Malthus and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on, from long continued observation of the habits of animals and plants, it at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. The result would be the formation of new species. Here then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. But it was to be another 20 years before the theory was sufficiently worked out to give to the world. In 1842, Darwin brought his family to settle here at Down House in Kent, and he began his careful, methodical routine. Darwin wrote a sketch of his theory in 1842, a short book in 1844, and a very long book from 1854. Finally, in 1859, the fourth version came out as On the Origin of Species. After 20 years' gestation, the book had become one long, carefully constructed argument which anticipates every objection the reader can think of. And The Origin of Species is in no way a deliberately provocative book. Darwin doesn't even discuss human evolution beyond saying discreetly that light will be thrown on the origin of man. And he makes the important point that psychology will become evolutionary in the future. He speaks of God as creator of the whole system of nature and the first living things. He doesn't mention his darker thoughts about the cruelty of nature. On the whole, the tone of the book is optimistic. It has still something of the flavour of the old theological science of the Parson naturalists of the past. 
Many leading scientists and some liberal clergymen were quick to accept its arguments. Darwin did have allies, but neither he nor they could do anything to avert the fury that broke over his head. Considering how fiercely I have been attacked by the Orthodox, it seems ludicrous that I was intended to be a clergyman. At that time, I did not in the least doubt the strict and literal truth of every word in the Bible. Whilst aboard the Beagle, I was quite orthodox. But I gradually came to see that the Old Testament was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus, or the beliefs of any barbarian, with its manifestly false history of the world, with the Tower of Babel and all the rest. By such reflections as these, I gradually came to disbelieve in Christianity as a divine revelation. So Darwin lost his belief in the literal truth of the Bible quite early in life. And he never seems to have considered the possibility of a liberal or critical view of the Bible. But that was not the end of his religion, because in his day, people believed that the existence of God, his design and creation of the world, and the immortality of the human soul, could be established purely by reason, independent of any scriptures or religious authority, but simply by arguing from the facts of nature. It was called natural theology. And it mattered a lot to Darwin, he didn't give it up easily. But Darwin was English with a certain literalness of mind. He always treated design and special creation by God as if it were a rival scientific explanation, an opponent of his own theory. The only sort of God Darwin could really understand was a scientific hypothesis God, postulated to account for the order in the world. As that sort of God faded out of science in Darwin's lifetime, so he faded out of Darwin's mind. The old argument from design in nature fails now that the law of natural selection has been discovered. We can no longer argue that, for instance, the beautiful hinge of a bivalve shell must have been made by an intelligent being, like the hinge of a door by men. There seems to be no more design in the action of natural selection than in the course the wind blows. Yet there remains the impossibility of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe, including man, as the result of blind chance or necessity. When thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look for a first cause having an intelligent mind. This conclusion was strong in my mind about the time I wrote The Origin of Species. And it is only since that time that it has very gradually, with many fluctuations, become weaker. But then arises the doubt. Can the mind of man, which has, as I fully believe, been developed from a mind as low as that possessed by the lowest animals, be trusted when it draws such grand conclusions? I cannot pretend to throw the least light on such abstruse problems. The mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us, and I for one must be content to remain an agnostic. Many people followed this darker and more agnostic side of Darwin's thought. The world process was amoral, and man was locked into it. No room remained for the ideas of a benevolent providence and life after death. However, when pressed, Darwin himself allowed that evolution might be compatible with faith in a creator. God had perhaps chosen this strange way of bringing us into being. So liberal Christians saw Darwin as teaching that the law of life is progress through struggle and suffering. Yet, for pessimists and optimists alike, Darwin marked a major shift in our view of life. Perhaps the profoundest shift of all is the passing away of the old belief that our true home lies somewhere else than on this earth. We're not, it seems, immortal souls who only temporarily happen to be housed in these bodies. Rather, we are products of nature embedded in nature. We're of the earth, to the earth we return. 
So the old kind of ascetical religion that punished and repressed human nature for the sake of a better life somewhere else now seems futile and indeed Christians are already giving it up to a remarkable extent. Religion returns to this earth. That perhaps is the profoundest impact of Darwin's revolution. During the 19th century, people began to look at everything in a historical way. Geology had become historical, and because the fossil record is woven into the rocks, biology inevitably had to become historical too. But the human central nervous system and human behavior have an animal background. So inevitably, as Darwin had foreseen, psychology next became historical too. The result was to be a revolution in the understanding of human personality. The human self begins to be seen in the image of this rock face. It's been built up layer by layer. Beneath the superficial conscious mind are the various layers of the pre-conscious and unconscious minds. The whole rests on very ancient foundations that perhaps we can no longer see and are not aware of. Nevertheless, they're still there, supporting it. In the traditional European culture, the basic experts on human nature had been the preacher, the moralist, the philosopher. Man was understood in terms of his relation to God. The basic concepts were reason, conscience, the will. And the philosophers had gone along with this. Only a few of them had so far attempted to set man firmly in nature. People like Hume and Schopenhauer. But now Darwin had decisively tilted the balance of the argument. After him, there was scope for a Darwin of the mind to work out a new theory of human personality in which the basic concepts would now be the biological drives, the economy of the emotions, and above all, sexuality. In 1899, Sigmund Freud brought his family here to Berchtesgaden in Bavaria for the first of what were to be many summer holidays. Freud was struggling to write the Interpretation of Dreams, which was to be a key book of the new century. On its title page, he put a motto from Virgil. If I can't sway the gods above, then I'll stir up the underworld. There's a lynx on the roof. What do dreams mean? Well, dreams are thoughts, and Freud was a determinist who believed that all thoughts have causes. So our dreams must have a meaning. What is it? Four years before, Freud had already come to the conclusion that our dreams fulfill wishes. You may yourself remember before a visit to the dentist, dreaming that the event has already taken place, so you've got it over. But many of our dreams are chaotic, frightening, we ourselves don't know what they mean or what wish they could possibly be fulfilling. Well, Freud had urgent personal as well as intellectual reasons for wanting to understand his own dreams. So for years, he systematically recorded and analyzed them. He came to the conclusion that even in sleep, a system of censorship operates. Our forbidden wishes can't come too openly to consciousness. They have to be encoded, disguised, so, writing on this veranda in this house in 1899, Freud set out to discover the logic of dreams. I told my patient that this dream must mean that when she was a child, she had wished she could see her mother dead. I would scarcely said this when she said that Link's eye was a term of abuse that had been thrown at her when she was a very small child. When she was three years old, a tile off the roof had fallen on her mother's head 
and made it bleed violently. The dream reveals a powerful cluster of buried childhood feelings towards the parent of the same sex, identification with her, but also a wish to see her dead, and then anxiety and guilt about this same wish. This cluster of feelings Freud was in time to call the Oedipus complex. And he was finding in dream analysis his royal road to the knowledge of the unconscious. Through dream interpretation, he was gaining insight into the deepest workings of the human mind. The idea wasn't wholly new. Freud himself quotes Nietzsche. In dreaming, some archaic relic of humanity is at work, something we can no longer reach by a direct path. At its deepest level, the human mind is a coiner of metaphors by which we spin around ourselves a protective cocoon to shield us from the ultimate truth of our own condition. It's ironical that Freud's classic statement of the primacy of the archaic and the irrational in the human mind should have been written here at Berchtesgarten, overlooked by the eagle's nest, the symbol of a force that would one day drive Freud from his home in Vienna to die in exile. Freud had brought his wife Marta to live here in the Berggasse, Vienna, in 1891. They were to stay until 1938. At first, there were few rooms and even less patients. The disciples, the international recognition, the financial security, and the title professor were delayed till Freud was about 50. In Freud's day, people who'd once taken their sins to priests were beginning to take their emotional problems to doctors. But the trouble with many of the patients who sat here in Freud's waiting room was that though they certainly had symptoms and knew that something was wrong with them, they were unaware of what it was. It seemed that the injury must lie in some unconscious region of the mind some buried memory which the patient didn't know about. The physician needed a technique for identifying the unconscious fears which were tormenting the patient and overcoming them. But to do this, he had to find a way to the unconscious area of the mind where the trouble was rooted. In psychoanalytic therapy, we require the patient to put himself into a condition of calm self-observation and then to communicate everything which he becomes inwardly aware of, feelings, thoughts, memories. The physician listens, forces the patient's attention in certain directions and observes the reactions. By means of such analysis, he can always discover the purpose behind the neurotic symptom. In fairy tales, there are evil spirits whose power is broken when you can tell them their names that they've been hiding from you, so with the neuroses, their existence depends on distortion and disguise. When their riddle is solved and the solution accepted by the sufferer, they will no longer be able to exist. Each day from eight till one and again from three till nine, Freud sat in this chair, chain smoking cigars and listening while a succession of patients lay on the couch. What was he doing? Freud often compared himself with a confessor or even an exorcist. But he wasn't judging sinners and he didn't promise so much as they had promised. He aimed to act as an interpreter and guide, piloting the patient through suffering to self-knowledge and self-acceptance. He aimed to teach us to do the best deal with life that we can. He doesn't promise any kind of perfect happiness and in this he's unlike almost all earlier teachers. He regards all ideas of a final salvation as harmful illusions. In the chapel at the Vienna Mental Hospital, which dates from Freud's time, worship might be seen as expressing a longing for healing and redemption. Not by Freud. His hostility was implacable. Religion was not a form of therapy, 
but itself an illness. Religious ideas are illusions. Fulfillments are the oldest, strongest, and most insistent wishes of mankind. The God Creator is openly called Father. Psychoanalysis concludes that he really is the Father, clothed in the grandeur in which he once appeared to the small child. The religious man's picture of the creation of the universe is the same as his picture of his own creation. The emotional strength of this memory image and the lasting nature of his need for protection are the two supports of his belief in God. This is what constitutes the root of every form of religion, a longing for the Father. But the world is not a nursery. Dark, unfeeling and unloving powers determine human destiny and the system of rewards and punishments, which according to religion governs the world, seems to have no existence. We view religious teachings as neurotic relics, and we may now argue that the time has come for replacing the effects of repression by the rational operation of the intellect. Freud's rejection of the Christian view of man could hardly have been more complete. He was a sort of Victorian scientific rationalist who wanted to increase the control of the rational conscious ego. Yet his thinking left a loophole. All his life he was fascinated by the archaic and he collected these marvellous statuettes, oriental, primitive and classical. He saw them as revealing something of the unconscious mind. He knew that the unconscious is the real dynamo of the personality and it's far older and greater than the conscious. And it thinks in mythical, magical and religious ways. It's the persistence in us of the archaic religious mind. And a follower of Freud's might well say to himself, why is Freud so preoccupied with his rationalism? Surely to achieve human wholeness, what we need is a marriage between the conscious and the unconscious. Perhaps the unconscious only seems so threatening and disorderly because we've become so alienated from it. But in reality, we need it. Here, perhaps, is the germ of a new understanding of religion. And Freud had a follower whose thought went along these lines. He was Carl Gustav Jung. Almost 20 years Freud's junior, Jung was the son of a Swiss pastor. He had already successfully applied and developed some of Freud's ideas when the two men met in 1907 and became close friends. But by 1912, profound disagreements on the centrality of sexuality in Freud's theory and on the place of religion, led to a complete and painful break. Jung had settled in this house in Küsnacht, near Zurich, where he practiced as a psychotherapist for the rest of his life. The inscription he set above his door proclaimed his personal starting point. Whether called upon or not, God will be present. It's an answer given by the Delphic Oracle in reply to a question about a coming battle. But for Jung, it means the religious question is inescapable. Sooner or later, the unconscious catches up with you. And it crystallizes the difference between Freud and Jung that led to the break in 1912. Freud had dealt mainly with neurotics, people he could talk to, and he saw his task as that of strengthening the rational ego so it could cope with life. But Jung, as a psychiatrist in a mental hospital, had dealt with the altogether more fearsome world of true madness, psychosis, where the ego is overwhelmed by the violence of the unconscious. He came to think that only religion could name the powers that then take over the mind and pilot the way towards spiritual health. These ideas were shortly to be tested in his own experience. During the years 1913 to 1919, Jung experienced a midlife crisis, as Freud had done at the same age. For years, strange forces and fantasies surfaced from his unconscious. He recorded it all in notebooks and paintings. He recognized that the images that kept cropping up were not purely personal. Rather, they were drawn from the primeval world of myth and symbolism. Thank you. 
But what was the meaning of this violent eruption? The first indication that Jung's experiences might have a constructive purpose came when he painted his first mandala in 1916. The figure is a kind of diagram of the spiritual life, of a kind best known in Himalayan Buddhism, though similar figures are found in many other religions, including Christianity. They're used as aids to meditation. The opposed forces at the circumference are resolved at the still center. So Jung's approach to therapy is based on a more optimistic view of the unconscious. Let me tell you a story which happened a long while ago. I was sent a young patient who suffered from incurable insomnia. She was a teacher who had successfully completed her studies, but who lived in constant fear of making a mistake. She would got into an unbearable state of spasmodic tension. I tried to explain to her that psychic relaxation was necessary that I, for example, found relaxation by sailing on the lake, by letting myself go with the wind, that this was good for one, necessary for everybody. But I could see by her eyes that she didn't understand. Then, as I talked of sailing and of the wind, I heard the voice of my mother singing a lullaby to my little sister, as she used to do when I was eight or nine, a story of a little girl in a little boat on the Rhine with little fishes. And I began, almost without doing it on purpose, to hum what I was telling her about the wind, the waves, the sailing and relaxation, to the tune of the little lullaby. I could see that she was enchanted. Years later, her doctor told me she came back cured and I always wanted to know what you had done. All she could tell me was some story about sailing and the wind, and I never could get her to tell me what you really did. How was I to explain to him that I had simply listened to something within myself? How was I to tell him that I had sung her a lullaby with my mother's voice? Enchantment like that is the oldest form of medicine. But it all happened outside of my reason, it was not until later that I thought about it rationally and tried to arrive at the laws behind it. She was cured by the grace of God. At Bollingen near Zurich, Jung built, largely with his own hands, the house he called the Tower. It was his own personal retreat, where he spent more and more time in the last 30 years of his life. Coming to the Tower was an act of recollection, as Jung withdrew into a place which was itself an expression of his own psyche in stone. Here, everything has its history and mine. Here is space for the spaceless kingdom of the worlds and the psyche's hinterland. There is nothing to disturb the dead, neither electric light nor telephone. I tend the fireplace and stove myself. Evenings, I light the old lamps. There's no running water and I pump water from the well. I chop the wood and cook the food. These Simple acts make man simple. How difficult it is to be simple. In Bollingen, silence surrounds me almost audibly and I live in modest harmony with nature. Thoughts rise to the surface which reach back into the centuries. From the beginning, I felt the tower was in some way 
a maternal womb in which I could become what I was, what I am, and will be. It gave me a feeling as if I were being reborn in stone. At times, I feel as if I am spread out over the landscape and inside things, and am myself living in every tree, in the clouds, in the procession of the seasons. We moderns are faced with the necessity of rediscovering the life of the spirit. We must experience it anew for ourselves. It is the only way in which we can break the spell that binds us to the cycle of biological events. Different thinkers draw the line between science and religion in different ways. Jung draws it along the frontier between the conscious and the unconscious minds. He always accepted that natural science gives us our only knowledge of the external physical world. But there's another world, also a common world, the inner world of the psyche. It expresses itself in the language of myth. And for Jung, religion is about that inner world and about the task of bringing the inner and outer worlds into harmony. All his life, he made objects in order to express and articulate his inner myths. Here's one that he made in 1958 when he was 83 years old. A primitive woman figure who stands for the anima, the feminine principle in his own psyche, is reaching up to draw milk from a mare, life-giving milk. It's looking forward to the age of Aquarius, when the feminine principle will be dominant, an age that stands under the constellation of Pegasus, the horse. Jung's psyche is prophesying the future. Not that Jung himself ever took such ideas literally. Rather, he sees our dreams, our fantasies and our art as carrying messages from our psyche that point out to us the path of our own future spiritual fulfillment. The three sections of the completed tower represented for Jung the trinity and the three parts of the soul. The heart of it, Jung's private meditation room, is still locked. Below, the open courtyard stands for nature. The whole complex makes up Jung's quaternity, the fourfold harmony, his favorite symbol for integration. Not surprisingly, Jung's approach to religion has been criticized. From his starting point, all religious ideas are equally valid as expressions of human psychic life. And all religious truths and religious objects are simply psychological. So he could be led up some pretty strange byways, not only astrology, but also alchemy and Gnosticism. And in his collected works, at least, he never speaks of God as being more than the God image in the human psyche. Nevertheless, Within those limits, Jung was able to do a great deal. And in reply to charges of self-absorption or mysticism, he would answer that what our age most needs is a rediscovery of the life of the psyche. He would have said that he was performing a public service by retreating into his tower. Not only do I leave the door open for the Christian message, but I consider it of central importance for Western man. It needs, however, to be seen in a new light, in accordance with the changes wrought by the contemporary spirit. Otherwise, it stands apart from the times and has no effect on man's wholeness. The idea of God is an absolutely necessary psychological function of an irrational nature which has nothing whatever to do with the question of God's existence. The human intellect can never answer this question, still less give any proof of God. Moreover, such proof is superfluous, for the idea of an all-powerful divine being is present everywhere, unconsciously, if not consciously, because it is an archetype. I therefore consider it wiser to acknowledge the idea of God consciously, for if we do not, something else is made God, usually something quite inappropriate and stupid, such as only an enlightened intellect could hatch forth. And did you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you now believe in God? Uh, now? Difficult to answer. I know. I, need, I don't need to believe. I know. What did Jung mean by claiming, at the end of his life, to know God? 
Remember the journey he'd taken. As a young man, he'd broken away from religion and joined Freud. He accepted Darwin's revolution in our understanding of man's place in nature. He accepted that the human mind is an evolutionary product and religion a natural psychological function. Religious beliefs give mythic, projected expression to our inner states. Well, all this was standard 19th century atheist doctrine. Yet, when Jung turned back to religion, he didn't discard it. He took it with him. If our religious beliefs are clues to our inner lives, then in all their forms they're equally valuable and instructive. So Jung became perhaps the first genuinely multi-faith religious thinker. But even more original was Jung's new form of religious naturalism. Before him, those who'd grasped that religion is indeed fully human had always ended up as unbelievers, people like Marx and Freud. But Jung finds a way back. Realising that religion is truly human, he sets aside supernaturalism and instead he brings forward the old mystical idea that the knowledge of God is in the end the same thing as self-knowledge. For Jung, the knowledge of God means a condition of inner integration, blessedness, wisdom, harmony with oneself and all nature, that our psyches are pursuing all our lives. So far, Freud's position, his public reputation, has been higher. But Jung's new sort of religious naturalism has a lot to teach all of us. Indeed, I suspect in the end we're all going to have to follow him. And here at Bollingham, it's surely right to give him the last word. My life is the story of the self-realization of the unconscious. What we are to our inward vision can only be expressed by way of myth. Myth is more individual and expresses life more precisely than does science. Thus it is that I have undertaken to tell my personal myth. We cannot make any final judgment about ourselves or our lives. At bottom, we never know how it has all come about. The life of man is a dubious experiment. It is a tremendous phenomenon only in numerical terms. Individually, it is so fleeting that it is literally a miracle that anything can exist and develop at all. In the end, the only events in my life worth telling are those when the imperishable world erupted into this transitory one. Everything else has lost importance by comparison. I can understand myself only in the light of inner happenings. It is these that make up the singularity of my life.